Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this Oceana semester presentation. And the event code for this presentation is 5154. This is the code that you need if you're taking the survey after the presentation. And all students who enter uh, the survey are eligible to, uh, for the $1,000 study abroad grant. So the more events you attend and the more surveys you take, the more chances you have to win the $1,000 study abroad grant. 5154, and you can find the QR code and the URL inside the Oceana Semester Program. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Mitchum, who is an Associate Professor of History and Chair of the Department of History at Duquesne University, which is where? Any uh, students know? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So he came a long way, and there is a Missouri Southern connection. Uh, Dr. Mitchum went to grad school at the University of Alabama with our own Dr. Megan Bever from the history department here. So when you're in grad school, you often form a tight bond with your fellow grad students, and you maintain those connections you know, years later, and that's what happened here. So Dr. Mitchum is here to give two talks for the Oceana semester, this one with a very intriguing title, and then at 10 o'clock, Australia and the Great War. And then we whisk him back to the Springfield Airport to make his 145 flight so that he can be back in Pittsburgh this evening. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Mitchum. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming this morning uh, to talk about something that I find absolutely fascinating, which is what it means to be Australian. Um, I, I, I've spent a number of uh, months in Australia. I've done a, two postdocs uh, with the Australian Department of Defense in Canberra, which is a tiny, sleepy little community. It's actually the world's smallest capital. And I, I've, I've long been intrigued by the issue of national identity. And so when I was asked to come give this talk today, I decided to, uh, to put a little spin on it by talking about Crocodile Dundee, but it dawned on me recently that most of you probably have no idea who Crocodile Dundee is, which is sort of a reflection of my age. So I, I got to thinking about you know, the ways in which Australian identity is at least understood and marketed in the United States. And last night when I was being dropped off at the jury end, I decided to, to add a, a section to this, which of course is, is Outback, right? Several years ago, we had a, uh, a visiting scholar at, at, at Duquesne from Australia National University who came, and I took her to dinner afterwards, and we were sitting in a sports bar, and a commercial for Outback came on, and it was a really loud television. Right, you've all been to Outback, right, where it's just sort of eat meat, drink beer, no rules, just, you know, blooming onions, right, all of this good stuff. And her mouth started hanging open. She had never heard of an Outback Steakhouse. She had never heard, you know, she'd never heard of a blooming onion, by the way. They don't eat blooming onions in Australia. Um, and she also pointed out that the largest beer on the menu, which is a 20-ounce beer, uh, is called the bloke. And I'll, I'll get to that significance here in a moment. But she said, this is the most reprehensible, you know, humiliating commercial I think I've ever seen. Like, basically, they have commercialized my national identity. And I said, do you not recognize any of this? She goes, oh, I recognize every bit of it. Um, this is our stereotype. This is the way that we are upset in the ways that people outside of Australia understand what it means to be Australians, and yet this is part of the way in which we try to represent ourselves to the world. And so national identity by its very nature is, is a story. It's about the way people understand themselves. It's a story people tell themselves about their past, but it's also a story that people tell the world. National identity by its very nature is exclusive. In other words, it's defined in definition to one another. So if you hear somebody blaring Lee Greenwood's song, I'm proud to be an American, or at least I know I'm free, that's predicated on the idea that somebody else is not American and somebody else is not free, right? But it can also be an inclusive identity. It can be something that helps unite a disparate group of people of different faiths, of different ethnicities, perhaps, languages, political creeds. It can be based around things like language, culture, food, sports, or also shared natural, national rituals, like the 4th of July. I mean, think about this. The, the 4th of July fireworks, the sort of quintessential American act, is, at least in theory, 
an opportunity for people to get together from different backgrounds and have some type of shared experience that communicates to themselves and to somebody else what it means to be Americans. And finally, I think we need to kind of think about this as in that all national identities by their very nature are, are invented. They're, they're made up in some way, that they have to be sort of communicated, they have to be discussed, and they're constantly changing over the course of time. So national identities then um, are at least in part based on stereotypes, but stereotypes have in some way, shape, or form some degree of truth. And so what I want to do today is talk about both the truths and the myths of what it means to be Australian. And I want to do that through, as best I can in 40 minutes, a history lecture. Uh, those of you that thought you were coming to something else, sorry, I am a historian. This is what I do. What I'd like to do is give you a history of Australia in 30 to 40 minutes, focusing on the ways in which this historical past has changed over time so that it shapes the way that Australians understand their past, their present, and I think just as importantly, their future. And there's three themes that I want to focus on. The first is the idea, and this is a cultural theme, is the idea of Australia's relationship to Britain. Those of you that are going on the study abroad trip will find that Australians have this sort of very strange and ambiguous relationship to their British past. It is, after all, a former British colony. The Queen is still the titular head of state in Australia and is on the back of their dollar, alongside a kangaroo, I should add. It's consciously part of the British tradition. It has the English language, the existence of a parliamentary system of government. Christianity is the dominant religion. And sports and food, the, the two most popular things in Australia besides beer are meat pies and Australian rules football. But by the same token, historically, Australians have sought to distance themselves from the British connection in a way that made Australia seem better, more advanced, more masculine, more virile, more egalitarian, and in some cases, smarter than British. They do this by playing upon things such as their convict past, their frontier persona, and ultimately just creating something of what one scholar has referred to as an identity crisis between an affection to Britain and a want to hold on to that shared British past and a conscious effort to forge its own future as a Pacific or oceanic nation. The second part of this, and this is related to the British connection, is, is, is looking at this through the understanding of race and, and ethnicity. Australia has long been seen and understood as a, quote, white man's country. The aboriginals who first settled Australia over 60,000 years ago were pushed aside as part of this colonial conquest. And, all, and British colonists consciously upheld this with a series of very strict immigration laws, what they ultimately referred to as the white Australia policy. But today, Australia is a multi-ethnic state. It actually has the eighth largest immigrant population in the world. And like New Zealand, and to a certain extent Canada, other examples of settler colonialism, Australians have consciously embraced, at least today, here I'm talking about sort of the late 20th, 21st century, Australians have consciously embraced their aboriginal traditions and aboriginal past in a way that the United States has really not done with Native Americans. And so we have to also understand this kind of ebb and flow of Australian identity as a debate, a very contested understanding of whether or not Australia is going to maintain its tradition as a quote unquote white country or a multi-ethnic country. The final part of this though is the way in which Australian identity is shaped by notions of gender. I cannot think of another national identity that is so personified by masculinity and the idea of the frontier male, what Australians like to refer to as the bloke. You can see this in Outback commercials. You can see this in Crocodile Dundee. You can see this in countless other examples of Australian culture. But at the, in a nutshell, this is a rough, smart, though often lacking in formal education, entrepreneurial, working class, frontier persona that emphasizes loyalty to his friends, to his mates. In 1958, a scholar tracing the understanding of Australia's past referred to this concept of the bloke. He said that a he's a practical man, rough and ready in his manners, 
and quick to decry any appearance of affection in others. He swears hard and consistently, gambles heavily and often, and drinks deeply on occasion. He is a great knocker of eminent people unless, as in the case of his sporting heroes, they are distinguished by physical prowess. He is fiercely independent, and above all, he will stick to his mates through thick and thin. Now, this is a problem in many respects because A, half of all, over half of Australians are women. B, recent changes in gender, gender stereotypes have challenged this understanding of an Australian masculine male. Um, I think sort of most ironically, though, C, the vast bulk of Australians live in the suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne, and the average Australian has never once set foot in the outback. So what I want to do now is talk about the origins of Australia. We're going to kind of talk about three periods of history here. The, the colonial period, which is basically the 19th century. Uh, the the uh, period of what we might think of as the new nation, after Australia becomes a unified country in 1900, and how that, has, that goes up to about 1945. And then I think the most interesting changes that we'll talk about occur after. 1945, when Australia faced increasing waves of immigration and consciously began to separate itself from the British connection, but also try as best as possible to maintain some degree of cultural independence from its new closest ally, the United States. And we'll sort of bring that up, not necessarily to the present, but to about the year 2000, and talk about some important moments where Australia was undergoing this, this ongoing identity crisis about what it, mean to, what it meant to be Australian. When we talk about Australian history, we can talk about it in two ways, the sort of prehistory of Australia, in other words, the, the fact that, that, that um, Aboriginal populations have lived in Australia for over 60,000 years, or a, a, a sort of settled colonial history that began in 1788 when British convicts and British Marines landed at Botany Bay, right south of Sydney, and set up the first European colony. It's fascinating, this Botany Bay example is, is so important to the definition of Australian history that when Australia built its first international airport, and, and those of you going to, to Sydney in the spring will do this, you land quite literally on the same strip of area that the settlers first landed in 1788. So, was the, so, so important was this, this site, this location for Australian identity because for white Australia, this was the beginning of its history. And it's also an important moment for trying to conceive of what it means to be Australian. Because Australia has, at least when we're thinking about its colonial history, has its origins as a convict colony. So basically what happens is in the late, 19th, late 18th century, the British government gets tired of putting people in jail, because jail is expensive. And so they decide to send them off to convict colonies, one of which is going to be this new convict colony in Australia. And so as a result, Australians have long sort of celebrated this idea that their ancestors are convict, convicts. Now let's be very clear, most of the convicts, and about 170,000 convicts are sent to Australia over the course of about a 50 year period. Most of those end up dying of disease long before they're able to reproduce. There are very, very few women sent to Australia, and by the 1840s, there are only about 140,000 people in the entire continent of Australia. So this is, this is the most Australians, in fact, very, very, very few Australians today can trace their ancestry back to convicts. But nonetheless, this creates the beginning of a conversation, a sort of almost being proud of the fact that their relatives were once convicted felons. We see a lot of this in rural Mississippi as well, as it turns out. That's a joke. Much of the early half of the 20th century, though, is a, a sort of a, a struggle between these early convicts and, and settlers and the aboriginal population of Australia. And so over the course, and this lasts from the earliest, within weeks of the landing at Botany Bay in 1788, all the way through the 1920s, there is a series of constant, ongoing conflicts between white society and aboriginal society that Australia collectively refers to as the, quote, frontier wars. Now, the frontier wars were not even mentioned in Australian history books until the 1980s. So sort of forgotten was this process of pushing Aboriginal populations off their land. And in fact, Australians in the 19th century saw this as a regrettable and yet natural course of events. The first book on Australian history, which was written in 1864, merely observed that, quote, the case of the Aborigines of New South Wales confirms that it would almost seem 
an immutable law of nature that such inferior dark races should disappear. Now, the convict past by the 1850s began to give way to something much more permanent, far larger, and that was the gold rush boom of the 1850s. In the 1850s, throughout various sites in Australia, large deposits of gold were discovered. And this led to a population increase that was quite remarkable. In 1838, we're talking about a continent that had less than 150,000, uh, about 140,000 people. By 1858, the population of Australia had, had crept up to 1 million. By 1888, 3 million. And by 1900, over 4 million. The vast bulk of these immigrants coming to work the gold mines, to set up shop, to, to, to you know, create farms, etc. The vast bulk of them are coming from Britain, but they're coming from different parts of Britain. They're the way, people from Wales, people from Scotland, people from Ireland, people from England. And so as best as they could, these, colonial, uh, uh, these new colonial subjects began to try and emphasize what, what was their sort of common identity. And it was not to be Australian. Rather, they began to see, if you've got, if you've got a, a, a village where a third of the people are from Ireland, a third of the people are from Scotland, and a third of the people are from England, what they began to identify most commonly was a common sense of being British. And so it was often sort of remarked upon that people in the colonies during the 19th century were actually far more British than the people in Britain themselves. You can see this, for example, this is the Prime Minister of New South Wales in 1890 talking about this new emerging sort of state of Australia's relationship to the British Empire. He says, the crimson thread of kinship Again, that family connection runs through us all. Even the native-born Australians are Britons as much as those born in London or Newcastle. We all know the value of that British origin. We know that we represent a race for which the purpose of setting new countries never had its equal on the face of the earth. A united Australia means to me no separation from the empire. That being said, as much as we sort of see these sort of pro, uh, uh, claims of being British and all this, this sort of bombastic uh, 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 language, we also can start to see a difference, a sort of definition of trying to identify what's problematic in being British and how people living, how these white colonials living in Australia are better than that. And we can see this coming from the very nature of the fact that most of the people flocking to Australia to work in the gold mines are working class, frontier types who are able to start establishing an anti-authoritarian, anti-authority, uh, uh, anti I should say, working class and sort of frontier persona that very clearly mirrors what's happening at the same time in the American West, right? This is effectively the equivalent of the American uh, prospectors and then subsequently cowboys of the 19th century. They began to see themselves as being more economically self-sufficient than people in Britain, as being more democratic, as being stronger, more virile, tougher. And in some cases, engaging in acts of anti-authoritarian, uh, uh, anti Robin Hood self, uh, sense of, of, of uh, uh, social justice me uh, measures that, that in some ways celebrated the idea of sort of the frontier outlaw. They began to refer to these people. Often these were individuals who had been thrown off of the mines, thrown out of the, the, the farms of the frontier. In other words, they were, they were unemployed. They were sort of living on the margins of society, and they were uh, attacking landowners. They were attacking mine owners. In other words, they were, they were acting as a sort of modern-day Australian Robin Hood. The most famous of these was a guy by the name of Ned Kelly. Anybody ever seen a movie about Ned Kelly? This came out a few years back. Um, Ned Kelly was the son of an Irish convict. So here, somebody with some actual convict credentials. Um, he became a, an outlaw, ended up killing three police officers, and was celebrated in sort of the Australian uh, popular mythos for this. He's a, he's, a, he's a folk hero in Australia today. He was also known for creating medieval armor. Uh, he had this giant sort of helmet that he would ride around, and he had revolvers. And so uh, uh, people would shoot at him, and it would sort of bounce off. Ultimately, he was captured in 1880, um, uh, tried and convicted and, and, and hung uh, by the neck uh, for, for these police murders. 
But to this day, again, he is somebody that is, is sort of identified as an Australian hero. This is, again, somebody who is an outlaw who is killing police officers. And so several years back, when the Australian government was trying to determine who they wanted to put on their new $5 bill, Ned Kelly's name was a prominent. And this, this great debate about why in the world would we put a convicted felon who killed police officers on, on, our, on our $5 bill, again gets back to this fascination, this obsession that Australians have with this sort of alleged frontier and convict past. Australians also began to develop a, a pride in democracy that became a cornerstone of Australian identity. Australia, the various Australian states in the 19th century were among some of the first in the world to develop universal male suffrage, doing this long before Britain or other European powers followed suit. But they took this a step further. They created, for example, something called the Australian ballot, which for much of the 19th century was what we called, even in the United States, we called the secret ballot. The idea that you can cast your vote without anybody knowing who you vote for because that allows you to divide, defy the wishes of your landlord, it allows you to defy the wishes of your boss, of your, of your labor leaders, whatever the case may be, this pride in sort of a democratic spirit was a big, big part of, the Australian, of Australian identity. They also flirted far sooner than most people with the idea of women's suffrage. Now, they were not the first Western country to adopt women's suffrage. That was New Zealand, beat them out in, by about a decade. But beginning in the 1890s, various Australian states began to adopt women's suffrage. And again, this is long before the United States or Britain would follow suit. Even today, Australians see themselves and really pride themselves on being the freest people on earth. And they do this in part, and this is sort of ironic if you think about it, they do this in part by making voting mandatory. In, in Australia, you receive a significant hit on your taxes if you fail to vote. It doesn't matter. If you're out of the country, you have got to find an Australian embassy, go register, and vote. Now, again, forcing people to vote sort of seems a little bit problematic if you're priding yourself on being free, right? But such is the importance that Australians place on political democracy in the 19th century that's again being carried through in this period. Now Australia, as I've said, is during the 19th century a collection of states, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania. There is no united country of Australia. There's not even a united colony of Australia. But in the 1890s, Australians began the conversations about uniting into a, a sort of unified quasi-nation. And this took place in 1901 with the creation of the Commonwealth of Australia. This federation created a federal government, which would initially be based out of Melbourne, ultimately would move to Canberra, a new capital they built solely for this purpose. There would be a federal parliament. There would be a prime minister. And Australia would enjoy dominion status, which I'll, I'll talk more about in my next lecture, but is basically a halfway house between nation and empire. In other words, as a dominion, Australia had complete and total autonomy in domestic affairs to create their own taxes, their own rules, et cetera, et cetera. They just didn't have control over their own international affairs. That, for example, when Britain went to war in 1914, Australia automatically went to war as well. The creation of federation arguably, or the, the initiation of, of a Commonwealth of Australia, arguably laid the foundation for a united Australian identity. Um, here, though, we can see that in the early years of the Commonwealth, Australians were not all that concerned with taking it to the next step. In other words, getting foreign control of their own foreign policy. Rather, they were far more concerned about maintaining this white Australia policy that had been informally part of Australian, the various Australian policies during the 19th century, but now became an almost obsession amongst Australian policymakers. The White Australia policy sought to limit immigration from India, from Japan, from China, from what ultimately became Indonesia, and to ensure that any immigrants into Australia were preferably white and English speaking, uh, uh, but at the very least were European. Now, this was not done in, in, in sort of veiled references or through backlogs. The actual name of this policy was called 
the white Australia policy. It was a sort of avowed understanding that Australia's future as a Pacific nation was to be a white man's country. In 1901, one policymaker said, quote, we have a breeding ground for colored Asiatics where they will soon be eating the heart's blood out of the white's population, where they will multiply and pass over our border in a mighty Niagara, sowing seeds of diseases which will never be eradicated and which will permanently undermine the constitutional vigor of which the Anglo-Saxon race is so proud. And as part of this sort of rhetoric, again, the idea that this, could this be British, could this be part of the same British tradition, he followed this up by saying, by maintaining a pure and homogenous racial country, we are more British than the people of Great Britain. So again, this is sort of a, 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 a optimistic vision of a future country that is to be white and British, but also maintain control over its own destiny. The beginning of the First World War in 1914 contributed to this conversation. I'm going to kind of briefly talk about this because I want to leave some time for, for uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk more about the First World War in my next lecture. But arguably the First World War laid the, uh, solidified the understanding of what it meant to be Australian for the 20th century. Most people in Australia in 1914 were actually born in Britain. In fact, the first five prime ministers of Australia were born in Britain. This is, in other words, these are you know, often sort of first uh, and second generation immigrants that are coming into line in, in the 1920s. But nonetheless, Australia mobilized a considerable proportion of its male population to fight in the First World War. And they did so largely on behalf of the empire. In other words, the, the, the opening rhetoric of the war was very much about serving the empire, serving other Britons in the world. But by 1915, particularly as the casualty rates began to climb up, there began to be an appreciation that Australians fighting in the trenches together were very much part of a new emergent nation. And this was based in part on the idea of the Anzac legend. Does anybody know what Anzac stands for? Anybody? Yes. Australia New Zealand Army Corps, in 1914, what they decided to do was lump the two countries' armed forces together into a common Army Corps, send it to the Middle East, send it to the Western Front, and there the kind of quintessential Australian soldier seen here with his slouch hat, his, his khaki uniform, um, who took pride in the idea of being a, a sort of, you know, mounted, rough, these colonial frontier soldiers are better fighters, they're smarter, they're more entrepreneurial, they're more egalitarian than the British Army. Again, despite the fact that the average Australian recruit was born in Sydney or Melbourne and had never been to the, to, to the outback. But again, it was this kind of pride in Australia's frontier origins that began to identify Australia and the Australian soldier as the quintessential archetype of what it meant to be Australian. In 1915, an Australian poet by the name of Banjo Patterson. This is a good sort of frontier poet name. If you're going to be a poet of the frontier, you don't want to be named Clyde or something like that, right? Um, he, wrote a, he wrote a poem that was, that was published all over the country called We're All Australians Now. It said, the metal that a race can show is proved with shot and steel. And now we know what nations know and feel what nations feel. The idea here was pretty clear that Australia entered the war in 1914 as a colony and emerged on the other end as a nation. Now, that is exaggerated to a certain extent. Many people still thought of themselves very much as British, but they also thought of themselves very much as Australian as well. Just as Texans like to think of themselves as Texans and Americans, Australians like to think of themselves as Australians and British. The Second World War contributed to this sort of further move away from the British connection. Um, in 1939, when Australia went to war, with, again, with the British Empire, this was before the Japanese had gotten involved. And so Australia sent the bulk of its armed forces to North Africa to fight alongside the British Army based on the understanding that if Japan got involved, the British would send the bulk of their navy to the Pacific and protect them. What ended up happening in early 1940, I'm, I'm sorry, in early 1942, after the Japanese had declared war on the British and on the Americans, is that the Royal Navy was no longer up to the job of protecting the British. 
Now, this has been conceived of in, the, in, the, uh, in Australian history as the, quote, great betrayal. This is the moment in which all those years of promises, right, that Britain would protect Australians was, 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 was proved to be a lie. And, and Australians went through a period for about six months of what we might think of as an invasion scare. Um, and you've got some, you know, this is a propaganda film here. He's coming south. It's fight, work, or perish. But it was based upon that same exact idea of a white peril, uh, I'm sorry, of a white Australia. The, 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 the quote unquote yellow peril from Japan was going to sweep in and eradicate the entire country. And in fact, the Sydney Morning Herald even published advice for mothers on how to kill their babies and then commit suicide in the event of a Japanese invasion. I mean, this was an absolute hysteria. And subsequently, it was the arrival in March of 1942 of United States Marine divisions that ultimately sort of assured Australians that they were not going to be invaded. But the quote unquote Yank invasion also created problems of its own. Over the course of the Second World War, over one and a half million US soldiers were stationed in Australia, which was at the time only had a population of five million. Australian soldiers fighting in the uh, in Italy and in North Africa, subsequently returned home to find that their girlfriends were no longer their girlfriends. They were the wives of an American airman or an American soldier. And this raised serious concern that in this kind of shift to the United States, Australia could actually become sort of, quote unquote, culturally colonized by the Americans. This editorial from the uh, Sydney Morning Herald in 1946 is a good example. Australia will have to decide shortly whether its orientation is to be west or east, whether it is to remain the easily recognizable British nation it was when the war began, or to become a nation of second-class Yanks, joined to the Republic on the other side of the North Pacific by a tie made up of hamburgers, Ford cars, Hollywood films, and dollars. In other words, this idea that American culture was going to come in and pollute what it meant to be British and pollute what it meant to be Australian. In the aftermath of the war, though, Australia began to basically, the, the, the sort of insinuation here, right, that Australia has to choose between being east or west, to choose between being a British-descended country or an American colony, so to speak. Ultimately, after 1945, Australians chose a third option, to be Australians, to, to, to identify and to begin sort of articulating a, a sense of Australian identity that had its roots in the British connection but was consciously something different. This was in part reinforced by a massive economic and immigration boom after the war. Australia was relatively untouched physically by the war. And so while European countries, Far Eastern countries, were rebuilding in the aftermath of 1945, Australia went through a massive steel boom. And so at one point, Sydney was actually the largest and, source, and most modern city in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this, is, this is the Sydney Scarbor, uh, Harbor skyline in 1974 right after the creation of the, uh, the now iconic Sydney Opera House, which was really s intended to be sort of a celebration of Australian industry and a celebration of Australian architecture. In addition, Australia witnessed a population boom as a result of post-war migration from Europe. Now, the most of these 6.5 million immigrants between 1945 and 1970 came to Australia. About a third of them came from England, but the other two-thirds came from places like Yugoslavia, Russia, Italy, Greece, Germany, the Netherlands. So in other words, Australia, for the first time, is seeing a wave of still mostly European immigration, but not from a British-descended uh, nation. This is going to create some significant challenges to those efforts to sort of hold on to the British connection. And as part of this, finally, in 1973, and many people see this as kind of the, the, the final fight that ends in divorce for the British Empire. Does anybody know what Britain did in 1973 that they're about to potentially undo? They joined the, economic, the European Economic Community, the predecessor of the European Union, and thus imposed all kinds of tariffs on Australian trade, and this, you know, this was seen as kind of the, the, the final straw that Britain is no longer really interested in maintaining any type of political or cultural relationship with Australia. Support, for example, of doing away with the monarchy began to rise 
And so in the aftermath of the 1960s, Australians began to focus on what, what, what cultural studies calls an Australian new wave, basically a sort of creation of a new Australian cultural identity expressed through things like film, right? So here are three iconic films. Has anybody seen any of these? No? Gosh, I'm getting old. Um, on the one hand, Mad Max, uh, which is basically about a guy who rides around in the outback in a sort of quasi-apocalyptic environment. Um, he's, he's bringing justice into his own hands. He's righting wrongs. He's, he's, he's driving around in a 1974 Ford Pursuit, um, covered in, in, in black leather and fighting skinheads. But at the end of the day, he's nothing more than a 1970s version of the bushwhackers of the 19th century. The most iconic Australian film of the, 19th, of the, of the 1980s was Mel Gibson's uh, uh, Gallipoli. Again, back to the Anzac legend here. An idea of two friends, both professional athletes, who enlist in World War I, fight at this, this disastrous battle of Gallipoli. Uh, one of them is killed as a result of the British generals not being able to, to communicate very effectively. This idea then of a loss of innocence, a frontier persona that is certainly more superior to Britain, and the idea of an Australian identity that's being forged in war and not in peace. And then finally, Crocodile Dundee, uh, Paul Hogan, sort of an Australian comedian of the 1980s, who lives in the outback, meets an American millionaire, goes to New York, doesn't know how to use toilets, and doesn't know how to you know, work elevators, but somehow or another is able to rely on this outback skill, this, ex this sort of s s street smarts, if you will, to navigate East Coast society in a way that shows ultimately just how superior Australians are. To Americans, right? So this idea then in the 1980s that Australia is beginning to celebrate its own sense of Australian identity that is not part of an American identity and certainly is not part of a British identity. This also comes out in music. The most iconic Australian band of this period, Men Without Hats, who's um, uh, iconic, sort of, sort of a one-hit wonder, right? But uh, at least in the United States. But their most famous song, I Come From a Land Down Under, and this is just sort of one of the lyrics here, it's a song about an Australian who's traveling the world, and every, every lyric is about being in a different part of the world and sort of trying to figure out how to order food, how to get a beer, whatever the case may be, and he's sort of expressing to his local host that he's an Australian and that he has this sort of uh, 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 Australian identity that is based in part on this, this roughneck appearance. It says, I was buying bread from a man in Brussels. He was six foot four and full of muscles. I said, hey, do you speak of my language? He just smiled and gave me a Vegemite sandwich, Vegemite being a sort of iconic Australian uh, snack, which is also horrific. Don't ever try it. Um, I come from a land down under where beer does flow and men chunder. Does anybody know what chunder is? This is an Australian slang for throw up violently. Where beer does flow and men chunder, can't you hear, can't you hear the thunder, you better run, you better take cover, right? So again, this idea of Australians being rough, working class, etc. At the same time that this Australian identity is sort of em emphasizing this, this rough persona, there's also a renaissance of what it means to be, uh, of, of, of Australia's long since dispossessed non-white population. And so during the 1970s, you began to see a celebration, a sort of recapturing of Australia's aboriginal past. Now this is partly a civil rights movement that begins to take off in the 1970s. And today, if you go to Canberra and you go to the old parliament building, Across the way there is what's called the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. It is, a, it is a basically a squatter's camp that was set up in 1971 by Aboriginals who, who, who set this up as their embassy, right? This idea that, that, that they are a separate nation and they refuse to be, uh, uh, to be quiet and that they want to be taken seriously. And it's interesting that the British, I'm sorry, the, the Australian government never recognizes the Australian Aboriginal Embassy but they also refuse to let people take it down. And so it still remains today and is still permanently occupied by elements of Australians' Aboriginal population who want to, to reinforce um, uh, certain cultural claims, political rights and whatnot, and you begin to see some of those political rights recognized in the 1980s and 1990s. There's also what some would say is a sort of renaissance of Aboriginal art and what other people would see as an appropriation of Aboriginal art. But during the 1980s and well into the 1990s, Australia begins to heavily identify with uh, 
uh, uh, iconic Aboriginal art as something that is, again, quintessentially Australia. I'm almost out of time, so I'm actually going to fast forward to two events that took place within three months of one another around 1999-2000. And this is kind of the idea that Australia is again facing to this, again, recognize it's now 2019, but into the 21st century, uh, Australia is facing something of an identity crisis. Keep in mind that today, the population of Australia uh, is, is approximately 18 million. Of that 18 million, um, uh, approximately 7 million are foreign born. So in other words, Australia, a good, a good percentage of Australians are not born in, in, in Australia. Now, the largest group of immigrants today from Australia are still English born. In other words, a lot of people from England will actually immigrate to this day to Australia. But the next two largest populations are from China and from India. So Australia is certainly less of a white man's country than it was in 1950, and certainly more than it was in 1900. This has created two moments in which Australians have to battle with the idea of what's next. The first occurred in 1999 when a referendum was introduced to make Australia a republic. In other words, to cease recognizing the Queen and the British connection as official. Polling suggested that about 60 to 70 percent of Australians would approve becoming a republic. And they had this debate. And interestingly, the debate had very little to do about the sort of cultural elements of the British connection. A lot of people would say, we shouldn't change, because if we do, we have to get rid of our coins and our post office. We have to get new business cards. Right? This is just a hassle. I mean, it was almost a sort of like those who wanted something radically new versus those who wanted something pragmatic. Ultimately, when the vote was held at the, in the very end of 1999, People were quite surprised that the vote failed, the vote to create a republic failed by a margin of 45 to 55 percent. Australians were certainly no longer embracing the British connection as part of their sort of understanding of what it meant to be Australian, but it seemed that they did not yet have a real understanding of what they would replace it with. Still part of this identity crisis. The second event occurred just a few months later, and this was the 2000 Sydney Olympics opening ceremonies. Now, everybody's probably watched. Where did we have the last Olympics? I forget. Um, anybody remember this? Doesn't matter. Opening ceremonies are an, uh, an opportunity for a nation to tell the world a story about itself, right? That's the whole point. It's a pageant. It's a very carefully crafted pageant. The 2000 Sydney opening, 2000 Olympic opening games was a pageant about the story of Australia. It began with this uh, mounted frontiersman here entering into this big arena, the O2 Arena in Sydney, uh, to the blaring music of the film The Man from Snowy River, which is a sort of quintessential Australian film about frontiersmen and bush rangers and all this good stuff. It was then followed by a young white girl who came in and spread out a beach towel and fell asleep, the beginning of a dream, a dream of, what, of, the, of the past. And it followed then an aboriginal segment which was heavily criticized for cultural appropriation. And then Captain Cook sailed in on a ship and settled. And then the bushwhackers come out when they're on their horses with Australian flags. And then at the end, it gets so bad that you actually have tap, tap dancing Sydney suburbanites pushing lawnmowers around. It was a really, all Olympic opening ceremonies are pretty horrific. But this one, as far as they go, was far worse. It ultimately, as most of these kinds of events do, pleased nobody. Some elements of society said that they spent too much time talking about Australia's multi-ethnic past. Others said that they didn't spend enough time talking about Australia's multi-ethnic past. And in an event that is supposed to be like the 4th of July, an event of a national ritual, ultimately began this process again of tearing the country apart with this heavy debate about what it meant to be Australian. And so we like to end our stories with some type of conclusion in which I give you what you need to know for the test and you write it down, right? And, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a final answer. This again, as national identities being a sort of ongoing process of conversation between people, is an open-ended open debate, right? In other words, what ultimately Australians as a, as a nation, as a people, will settle on in terms of this sort of identity and this, this common sense of being Australian is something that is, again, heavily contested and currently ever-changing.
I will, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, I'll leave it off there. Thank you. <laughs>